Hey, hey, welcome to a brand new episode of the Straight Up Show podcast. I am your host, Calvin. I'm actually going in solo today. Uh, my two co-hosts, Brandon and Lee, had the episode off. Uh, you will talk, you hear them next episode, but I kind of gave them the week off because uh, those two have been working uh, a lot. And I want to thank them so much uh, for helping me out and helping the show out. Because as you can tell, uh, if you've been listening to the show, we put out some great uh, episodes, some great material. And we want to thank you all who have been listening for the, the feedback and the comments and the, the, the sharing and the liking of our pages. So we want to take this time and say thank you so much. And I think these two probably would want me to do this show anyway because I want to talk about protesting in sports. Uh, as you know, people have uh, seen have made monumental changes because they're protesting after the death of uh, George Floyd. And his death is kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back. And people really want to see change. They're tired of just getting it a little bit of change. They want to see massive change happen. And it's from uh, government policies to different laws. And now it's, 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 it's going to sports. And some people aren't happy, especially the fans of NASCAR, who have seen that NASCAR has decided to ban the use of of the Confederate flag, uh, whether it's clothing, flags, or whatever, they don't want that image in the NASCAR stadiums at all. And a lot of fans are not happy about this. Some drivers are actually petitioning to protest uh, their own rights to actually have the flag uh, at NASCAR. But I know some athletes, especially in football, are, are protesting as well. I've seen some athletes protesting uh, along with the other protesters, especially in California with Russell Westbrook and uh, uh, a lot of people have been protesting. I know that a lot of one quarterback in New Orleans, <laughs> he has uh, got a lot of flack for what he said uh, about the protest, the flag, especially when it involved Mr. Colin Kaepernick. Uh, we all know what happened. Colin Kaepernick kind of got blackballed from the NFL from protesting by taking a knee during the national anthem. Uh, that raised a lot of flags. A lot of people, they didn't like that, and it kind of got him banned from the NFL. Now that all this has happened, uh, Commissioner Roger Goodell has came out and said that he was wrong about the flag and what it kneeled, and Drew Brees himself came back and had a change of heart, too. So uh, we want to talk about these athletes who were protesting. And should protesting be allowed in sports? I know that I've seen one thing, one particular athlete who was about to go to college was committed to a D1 school, but he says, you know what? I'm going to take my talents to an HBCU because I want to feel prideful. So we're going to talk about that. My guest today is going to help me with this. We're going to talk about how athletes should protest and if it's okay to protest in sports. And uh, he is a big Drew Brees fan. And I want to get his thoughts about what Drew Brees said. And we want to know, could there be change in these sports if athletes decide to protest? We're going to find out next. Stay tuned. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. And we're back. And I'm actually here with one of my good friends, uh, somebody that I actually work with and uh, look up to a fellow uh, sports reporter, sports photographer, and just all around good guy. Uh, Dan, how you doing today, Dan? Pretty good, Calvin. How you doing, man? All right, man. Pretty good. Thank you so much uh, for being on the show today. And um, we're talking about just how African Americans are in the NFL right now, or just playing sports, period, and how some athletes are actually boycotting. And I just want to see, you know, just I know just first off, how how are you feel about everything going on right now uh, as the world stands today? In terms of athletes speaking their mind, um, it makes my job a lot easier because it gives me content. But just as a human being, I love it when people speak their mind and exercise their First Amendment rights and, and become a part of the conversation. So. Um, while it is a volatile time in our country, more involvement from the public is better than less involvement because you have inputs from perspectives that normally would be silenced, um, in previous decades. But, uh, you know, you have several athletes starting to lead the conversation. And I think that's a positive step to moving our society forward. Okay. And Dan, like, so you are a fellow Louisianian, or I don't know what we call ourselves, but, um, and just 
if you don't mind, I don't know how appropriate this is, but can you just tell us uh, what do you identify as, like especially ethnically? I identify as a black man. Um, both my parents are black. Um, I like to joke that I am uh, melanin deficient or uh, extremely light skin. Uh, I sunburn easily, so I think that I can tell you my uh, skin tone. Uh, but my dad, he is uh, looking at him. He's he's a black man living in America that uh, faces the same struggles that most face. Um, but he's also, um, I guess, more of a uh, a lighter skin variety. So he he has his own challenges of, of facing his um, pushback from 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 fellow people within the black community when he was growing up in high school for not being. Uh, per se, black enough, um, a, a darker shade of black. So I definitely identify as black, um, but maybe on first glance, I look like a uh, someone who could be passed as white. Uh, I was told I could pass as white growing up as a kid, and uh, that was viewed as a good thing. And I, I, my position of where I am in life right now, I can see the benefits of that. But I definitely um, identify as a black man um, that has you know, benefited from, from a, a lighter skin tone. Wow. And that's, uh, that's pretty deep, man. Thank you for that answer. And I want to kind of build up to that because me, a lot of people, when they think about, they say, oh, you're from Louisiana, uh, you're, you're automatically, or are you just from New Orleans? Like, no, I'm not from New Orleans. I'm from upper, <laughs> upper part of Louisiana. And Dan can tell you that if you cut Louisiana in half, the top is way different from the bottom and Dan's from the bottom part of it. And so, he kind of has what you what people think that what Louisiana is like. Dan is that definition of Louisiana because you're from the South of Louisiana. And uh, you, what people don't understand that we all are the saints. And I, I can be skeptical here. I, I can be wrong. But there were a lot of fake Saints fans when uh, they came before Katrina. And, you know, after Katrina, Drew Brees came. And uh, then we had a whole bandwagon. The whole state was, you know, loving them. But before, people were wearing paper bags and stuff. And, you know, now we have all these new fans. And speaking of Drew Brees, he is kind of in the news right now because of some statements he said. And, uh, Dan, when I heard what he said, uh, I understand what he was talking about with the pl- the flag and protesting and taking the knee. Uh, but at the same time, I had to take a step back and say, hey, you know, he did do a lot for the community. He did, you know, he loves people. But I, I just want to get your take about, him coming out during this time, especially right now, and just saying how he views disrespecting the flag by taking the knee. Yeah, we're recording this on Wednesday, June 10th. I think this is a week removed from his initial comments. And the thing that got Drew Brees in trouble is that from the premise of the question uh, from the Yahoo Finance report was, you know, athletes would, I'm, I'm paraphrasing kind of everything here. I don't have the exact quotes, but basically, Athletes may start kneeling again in the NFL as a form of protest during the national anthem. Keyword, during the national anthem. Drew Brees' answer was a take-it-or-leave-it approach of if you protest during the national anthem, you're disrespecting the flag and you're disrespecting the country and the military. Now, there was no acknowledgement of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, the reason behind these protests, and his quote was pertaining to, I won't be able to agree with anyone that disrespects the the flag. So you're basically cutting off everybody that would want to protest during the national anthem and their perspectives and the pain and hurt that would bring them to kneel during the national anthem. And that that set off the firestorm of basically Drew Brees does not agree with me, does not agree with, with my standpoint, cannot see, cannot feel my pain, cannot understand my pain. And that was why he received the swift blowback. Over the next few days, Drew Brees apologized several times, eventually uh, released a video statement after two written statements. And um, the president got involved and, and said Drew Brees should have never backed down from his initial stance. Drew Brees, uh, eloquently responded to to the president in a way that was like, no, it's not about the flag. So Drew Brees showed a level of growth that his teammates have seen and they've forgiven him for it. Uh, namely, Demario Davis is probably the most vocal one in terms of on the forgiveness side. Um, Malcolm Jenkins uh, 
has said, uh, you know, his, his comments about it. He may not, he was initially uh, one of the more vocal players uh, on the first day that it happened that was definitely hurt by Drew Brees. You could hear the pain in his voice. And that the man, um, you know, uploaded a video to Instagram, deleted that one that showed his, his initial kind of first thoughts and eventually kind of warmed around to Drew Brees and kind of uh, respected his apology. So Drew, Drew got himself in hot water um, because he could not um, – understand or he portrayed himself as being someone that could not understand why someone would protest he's he's come around since then um ver- verbally he's, he's, ex- he's expressed those uh changes in belief and his teammates have have seemed to have given him forgiveness will the rest of the saints fan base that still hold those strong feelings forgive him that'll that'll come over time because drew Brees is not a racist. Let's put that out. Right. Like Drew Brees right. was never right. a racist. The man, right. the man has done, has done a lot for the community of New Orleans, done a lot for the state of Louisiana, the Gulf coast uh, in general, but you know, primarily we're focused on Louisiana here. Drew Brees donated $5 million for COVID um, relief efforts, uh, you know, helped, helped usher in a re a rebirth of the city of New Orleans after it was hurting so bad after Katrina. So you're going to, you you're going to have more willingness to forgive Breeze within the Saints fan base and, and the general population um, than maybe somebody from, say, a Philadelphia or um, a Minneapolis or, you know, some other players. You've seen some players that I'll never forgive Drew Breeze. And, and, and that's fine for them to ha- have that stance. But, uh, you know, within the Saints locker room themselves, you've heard, um, you know, Shaq come out and say, don't let the media divide you. You heard Spike Lee talk about, um, Drew Brees' response to President Trump. So there, there's a sense of forgiveness in the Saints locker room um, to, to show that Drew Brees has grown from his hardline stance of not wanting to see anyone kneel during, during the national anthem. And you have a, you have a right to, to, to view um, someone going, a, a, someone expressing themselves their first amendment right to protest during the national anthem because you have a strong belief in the mi- military, but, there were also black members of the military that didn't enjoy the same rights that, uh, you know, fought in these wars as well, that still face discrimination uh, to this day um, in, in some form or fashion. So that that's, it was, it was a, a not willingness to, to see the other side that got Drew Brees in trouble. But I think he's come around to that kind of a long answer, but no, it's a lot, it's a lot to it. It's a no, lot. To no, it. no, that's, that's definitely fine, man. You definitely answered like five questions later. Uh, more than I was going to ask you. So, I mean, that's that that's right. And I think and it, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the biggest problem was he didn't understand. And then within like 48, 24 hours, 48 hours, he was able to talk to people and see the frustration, like you said, and kind of go around. And I think that especially people, even in the NFL, not just in Louisiana, I mean, we have people who really don't know. I mean, even at my real job, I have people, you know, of different ethnicities who do not understand what people go through. Like the TV can only show you so much. And so these people, especially in Louisiana, they can see what Drew Brees has done, like you said. And, you know, and he, he was educated, you know, and maybe seeing the, hey, well, the blacks did serve in the military too. You know, maybe I, I was wrong. And then speaking of being wrong, uh, NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell has said that, speaking of kneeling about the knee, uh, kneeling at, uh, during the anthem, that the NFL got it wrong when it came to Colin Kaepernick. Uh, he has since apologized and said he is wrong. I don't know if he really gave an official apology to Colin Kaepernick, but he said that he was wrong. So a lot of people are asking now, uh, should we give Colin Kaepernick just an automatic pass to join the NFL or get an automatic sign to the NFL? I want to get your perspective about, you know, Roger Goodell now apologizing and should everybody saying that Cap needs to have a job right now? What do you think? Colin Kaepernick should have had a job um, the year after he was, you know, released or his contract expired with the San Francisco 49ers. He has the talent level to be in the NFL, whether or not he wants to be a backup or a starter um, and the willingness to be a backup, that could have been an issue. But we all know the reason why Colin Kaepernick was not in the NFL is because he was the one um, along with Eric Reed um, on the San Francisco 49ers that started kneeling. So that was, they blackballed Colin Kaepernick. You had a, a former NFL um, communications uh, executive 
that said, basically, we messed up. And then, obviously, you mentioned Roger Goodell also saying that, we, you know, we shouldn't have silenced protesters. So that was an ex- that was an acknowledgement of what the movement that Colin Kaepernick started. Now, when we talk about um, Colin getting back in the job, you don't want it to get back into the NFL. You don't want it to seem like, oh, OK, well, now, you know, now now that it's all good, we can bring him back. You know, this should have this should have been happened uh, for Colin Kaepernick. He had the, the kind of um, combine workout thing that went down in Georgia that, that, you know, they got into legal back and forth about, you know, waiver on getting hurt. So it, it, it kind of blew up from there, but Colin Kaepernick should have been on an NFL franchise. Um, whether or not he wants to be a backup or a starter is, is a question for another day, uh, which will also, um, you know, determine whether or not he does get on it because he, he's not going to come off of uh, four years right. being on the league if I, if I have my timeline correct and be a starter on a, of an NFL franchise. He would probably have to come in as, as a backup um, and, and compete for a starting job. Could he win a starting job after four years? Definitely. I mean, uh, it, it's definitely possible. Um, should Adrian be, Peterson. They, they, right. But, but the thing, the thing, um, kind of getting lost in in, in my thought here, but legally with the settlement that the NFL and Colin Kaepernick had, I don't know the parameters of that on whether or not um, Roger Goodell can even mention Colin Kaepernick's name. I've seen, you know, some speculation on that between various national reporters about whether or not Roger Goodell can even bring up the name of Colin Kaepernick or or Colin Kaepernick can say the name of Roger Goodell. Um, So, so you kind of get into some legal battles there, but should Colin Kaepernick, uh, be allowed to be back in the NFL, uh, of course, whether or not a team will take that chance on him um, remains to be seen, but definitely Colin Kaepernick deserves another shot in the NFL. All right, so we still have Dan with us today. Uh, Daniel, I want to thank you so much for just joining us. I want to give another thanks to you because I did work with you uh, and your team, and uh, you guys gave me opportunities to do things in sports that I've never done in my life, and you educated me on a lot of things. One thing I was able to do working with you and your team was I was able to actually interview Tom Herman uh, when he was in Houston. And I think I was that same day, I was Baker Mayfield and uh, Tom Herman, and I was like, man, I just – I was interviewing Tom Herman and just to see how he turned the community around in Houston, especially with the Cougars, you know, he went on to be with Texas and he about, he gave me a statement about what's going on. And I'm gonna read this to you, Daniel. He says, there's a double standard, maybe a little bit. We're going to pack a hundred thousand people uh, in the stadiums to watch uh, and millions of them to watch on TV and it's basically saying that they want everybody to cheer and do stuff like this and cheer on these athletes. But, why is the double standard to them dating our white daughter or hiring them in a position of power? And he's basically saying that, and it says a lot more, I'm just paraphrasing a little bit, but that, you know, how can we cheer for these black athletes and, you know, admire and adore them. But when it comes to dating our white daughters or, or even giving them a position of power in a, in a corporate America, like, why can't we do that? And why is that a double standard? I guess it just goes back to the general view of, you know, the the placement of, of black people in, in our society. You know, what can you do for me in terms of bringing me money, bringing me entertainment? Um, but can you have a, an official seat at the table? Uh, you will, you want to see uh, more minorities in a, in a position to, to ha- have power and, and show diversity and, and bring these, different voices um into the, into these power structures whether it be a head coach position uh sitting on the the board of directors at a fortune 500 company or being the ceo of a fortune 500 company um why this still pertains uh, this is the reason why people are in the streets right now it's a, it's a system that uh doesn't fully uh recognize the contributions of um members of our society that have worked the hardest have to work twice as hard to get where they are um, when we're talking about, you know, academics, but from an athletic standpoint, uh, you know, they're welcome, they're, they're coveted, but whether it comes to welcoming them into the family, that's, I guess, these biases that, that some people may have, like, oh, you can, you can run 
uh, 50 yards and score a touchdown or, you know, dunk, dunk a basketball, but I better not see you, you know, bringing my, my daughter to the movies or, or something like that. So I guess it's kind of an, an individual case by case basis because, you know, we have come become better as a society of, you know, welcoming interracial couples. It's something that, you know, we become better at, but it's definitely something Tom, Tom Herman is, is onto something on that. Like he, he is someone that, that recognizes the problem of, you know, athletes being accepted in one way, but not being accepted in another way. So that's definitely something that does exist uh, on about if uh, someone can be in, in a position of power or, you know, be a member of a family uh, of, of a different race. So Coach Tom Herman definitely is uh, open and wise to, to what's going on. And, uh, and he is because – I mean, I'm not, I mean, you talked about this pre-show, uh, but there was an athlete that, you know, that was from our area locally, and he went on to play at LSU. You know, a great guy. Uh, I'm pretty sure you've interviewed him before. I interviewed him before. But uh, just even him coming back home, he wasn't performing uh, the best way for people that loved LSU. And, of course, we all know in Louisiana, LSU fans are probably some of the craziest fans ever. But, you know, he was performing, you know, it wasn't been doing great. Probably was the system. I blame it. But he had the hottest face coming back home and he couldn't even go places and hot out. And I remember last time I saw him, he had to walk around with a hoodie over his head because he was scared of people would see him, not because of the celebrity, but because he was, they were having a bad season this year and people were calling him all kind of racial slurs online and, you know, and even interviewing uh, Dak Prescott one time, he got into a little a situation uh, in Florida where he got into a fight. And I remember asking him, you know, you know, what happened? And he said that it was either get beat up or, you know, lose me being labeled. You know what I mean? And so, I mean, mm-hmm. you've been in a lot of locker rooms. I mean, what, what do you think athletes really think about stuff like that? And just they have to perform or, you know, these fans just turn on. Well, I mean, that's kind of the nature of athletics. You're loved one second and then you're hated the next, depending on the result that happened on the field. Um, Black athletes definitely have to face it more. You know, just the nature of the South, you know, you'll have these white faces that, you know, will cheer a Black player scoring a touchdown. But as soon as he, you know, makes a mistake, they may throw out a, a racial a racial epithet, you know, a racial slur. Um, or look at this so-and-so uh, messing up here on this, on this play, but then he'll do something good for you. And say, oh, it's all, it's all good. So it, it's, it's something that athletes face just in general, whether you are, um, you know, black or white, people loving you when you're successful and people hating you when you're not successful. Um, but black athletes definitely face it more in terms of having a racial slur thrown at them um, for a minor offense. And, and in the case of Dak Prescott, um, he can't control, you know, how somebody steps to him. Um, he can defend himself the best way he can. Uh, we're talking about the, the incident at the beach uh, where Dak was, you know, caught, you know, fighting a, a group of people that, you know, ganged up on him. And he, can only, he, he can't control cell phone video coming up on him and, and filming that incident. Uh, but you got you to defend yourself. So, these athletes, you know, they're under a constant microscope, whether it be on social media or out there on the field, um, you know, performing on the field or the court. So they're under a microscope and they also, you know, get the blowback um, from people that only see them as an athlete. They don't see them as a human being, which is part of the conversation uh, that we're having right now as a country whether or not these, these athletes can be outspoken um, and also perform on the field at the same time. It, it's, it's this problem of you can do one thing or you can do the other. You can't do both. And these athletes should be able to do both, be human and be um, great at their craft. Hey, everybody. Lee here. And guess what? The reviews are in and the Straight Up Show podcast is a hit. Don't believe me? Well, listen to what one of our guest panelists, Dr. Monique Thompson, has to say. Listen, y'all listen in to Straight Up and support this podcast because I listened in before I came on the show. I liked what I heard. They're really focusing on keeping things real. 
and being real with you. And I like that approach. So you guys support this podcast. So if you want to listen, donate to the show, have a subject idea, or even want to be a guest, just contact us at straightupshow at gmail.com. That's straightupshow at gmail.com. Okay, Dan, I just want to thank you, man. Just some good points you've been giving us today. Basically, uh, what's going on now is that people are protesting. People are, are saying that they want to do more pro-black stuff, like watch more movies. Or I know right now, as we're recording this, there's a big thing talking about defunding the cops. Uh, but a young athlete uh, by the name of Mikey Williams, you know, a very top pick in basketball. Uh, but he wants to – he's considering now – I'm not for sure it's for a protest, but – He's considering to go to an HBCU, and he's not the first athlete that I've seen about doing this. I see some college athletes on Twitter saying that they want to just quit their top level school and just go to an HBCU because they feel like they'll be more appreciated. And in, 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 in terms, it really would help a lot of funding for those schools. But a lot of people forget that there's some great athletes that come out of HBCUs. Michael Strahan, uh, just I, there's a lot of people, but. Do you think that this would be a not really a wise choice, but okay for some athletes to really just say, you know what, I'm not going to be that you know punching bag from when I can't score a touchdown or we're losing or you know you think they'll be more safe at an HBCU or be more appreciated at a, a, a HBCU? They definitely wouldn't face uh, criticism uh, on the scale that black athletes face at predominantly white institutions. Uh, you know, you, you can look at any message board from any from any program, whether it be, you know, the Big Ten, SEC, um, some some disparaging remarks are made about, you know, black athletes uh, from, from some of these white quote-unquote fans. It would be a positive step. I mean, it, it's, it's, it comes down to what the kid wants to do. Like, do you want to go to a school that is going to help educate you? Are you trying to be a one-and-done? Uh, it's basically what, what college best serves what you want to do. Are you focused on your education? Are you focused on being a, a one and done type athlete? If you want the level of exposure that a Division One program like, say, a Duke or you know an Ohio State can bring, um, North Carolina can bring, then go that route. But if you have the option to change the discussion on HBCUs and what they can do, HBCUs are a valuable part of, of American society. Um, to this day, you have so many black executives that you know, do make it to these to these um, positions of power and they have an HBCU background, whether it be a Howard or, or a Spelman or, or what have you, a Grambling State University, a, a Southern University. So um, HBCUs have a valuable part in our society and the athletic side, you know, Grambling has a number of Hall of Famers because that's the only place where black athletes could go because of segregation back in, you know, the 50s and 60s. Um, once uh, there was integration, these athletes could go to Alabama's, Tennessee's, and, and so forth, um, the LSU's, and that's when you saw the dip in terms of uh, success. Um, the number number of athletes coming from HBCUs, the number of, that would go on to succeed at, at higher levels. So um, for for uh, Mikey um, decides to go to HBCU if it, if it benefits him. Um, he'll, he'll definitely be, uh, a, a, a trendsetter, um, in, in terms of, you know, being that first guy, uh, with such high braids on, on his athletic skills, um, in recent memory to, 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 to go that route. But it, it's basically what, what is he looking to do? If he wants more exposure from, I guess, a, uh, a national standpoint, he could go to a Duke or North Carolina. Um, but if he wants to kind of be a, a, some national exposure on whatever HBCU institution he decides to go to, he can go that route as well. Um, you can succeed at a HBCU and make it to, to the next level. Um, you're not going to get the same level of, you know, conference competition, say that you would get into the ACC as opposed to the SWAC or the MEAC. But you can, if you, if you want to focus on your academics and get a great education at HBCU, that's not, yes, your prerogative. And if you also want to succeed and, and get scouted, you can do that at an HBCU as well. Um, if you have the talent, the higher ups will come find you. They're finding people in Israel, they're finding people in Australia. They can find you in Grambling, Louisiana, or wherever uh, HBCU wants to, he wants to go to. Good deal, good deal, man. You're definitely right. 
Uh, Daniel, thank you so much for being on the show today. Uh, you really taught me a lot. Uh, just kind of giving us uh, in depth of what you see and stuff like that, and kind of giving advice. And but if you had one message to get give to those, especially those athletes that you see almost on a daily basis, especially those black athletes, uh, what's going on? I mean, how can they contribute uh, with this one to HBCU stuff like that? But what message could you give to them? I guess to everybody else. I, I guess my advice would just be try to read up as much as possible on you know current events. Uh, stay informed. Stay engaged. Uh, do some research on some of these uh, these activists that have that have gone out there and, and going into the streets. If if you want to you know pursue that side, um, you know Angela Davis, uh, of course MLK, and uh, it's 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 about it's about informing yourself but also, you know, being active as well if you want if you want to get on that side uh of it. And and, and just, you know, be a be a little positive. Uh we have enough we have enough negativity in this in this world. Um be a positive voice for good, be a positive activist uh for change. Um if if, if that's what you want to uh get into. And, and and just try your best to to be to be a light in this world. Um, there's nothing wrong with the healthy tension uh, uh, of causing a disruption in terms of, of being being uh, socially aware and, and making you know these these conversations in our in our daily life. Like it's it's okay to be uncomfortable at this point because this is this is not an easy subject to talk about. Um, but the more that we have these conversations, the more that we get involved. Um, the better we can become and, and move forward. So we don't have to have these conversations anymore. We will always have these conversations. Um, it's just the nature of America, but we can get to a better place and, and hopefully come out on the better side of this moment in our nation's history. All right. Thank you, man, for telling me that. And I want to say, cause I, from journalist to journalist, man, I want to thank you so much for going out there and telling these athletes stories that most people won't be able to hear because people don't want to really admit it, but it's people like you, people like where your team that when you write stories about them or that helps them get noticed. So even though the, the people are saying fake news as a journalist, I appreciate you working, you know, and, and what you do, man. And I know that I looked up to you and you helped me out a lot. So I, I want to give my gratitude and thanks to you, man. So thank you so much for everything you've done. And thank you for being on the show today. Oh, no problem, man. Glad to be here. Big thanks for Dan coming on the show today and helping me out. I really needed your help today uh, to break down things. I mean, I guess you all can see why I had Dan on the show because he loves sports and he's not scared to drop some straight up knowledge on people. And he's one of the most laid back people I ever met. I think Tom Herman said it best. If you're going to cheer and love these athletes for three and a half hours in the fall, you better have the same feelings for them off the field because they are human beings. So, what if five-star recruits decline scholarships in schools like LSU, UFC, Alabama, or Clemson? What if they start a brand new trend for athletes to go to HBCUs like Grambling, Texas Southern, Florida A&M, or Jackson State? Notice in my last statement, I didn't say black athlete. Simply, athlete. Maybe these schools deserve a spotlight. A huge spotlight that has not been around since 1968 when Gremlin and Morgan State packed out Yankee Stadium. Hell, I want to see a HBCU win a national championship. I'll even settle for a college playoff spot. But once again, settling is why people are protesting right now. It should be fair for all. All collegiate athletes, all professional head coaches, and there should be more owners. Some would say, Star athletes choose a big name school because of the recognition and a fast track to the pros. I admire stars like Tredavious White. No, not because he's from the same city as me or grew up the way I did or because I've interviewed him, but because like me, he knew having an education was more important. And in his case, more important than leaving LSU his junior year to go to the NFL. He now can say he's a college educated NFL pro bowler. So what if these black or brown athletes don't attend an HBCU and come play for your team? Gives your team a championship, gives you lasting memories. Would you help them with a better career opportunity? 
if their professional career stalls? Would you let them date your child? Would you see them as your equal outside of their playing field? I think star athletes like Drew Brees is what our nation needs right now. He had a different opinion about something he stood for, but was willing to learn and apologize for an insensitive statement he made days after the world experienced yet an, another unjustified killing of a minority. Many will not forgive Brees for what he said. Many will think his apology was staged. But as Dan stated, somebody that's from Louisiana, from the same area, he has done a lot for the black community in Louisiana, especially in New Orleans. So what if his apology was staged? Keep educating people like him. Keep putting people like that in check. So maybe one day they'll learn to listen and understand and join the rest of the world now and wanting change for equality. People want change right now. That's what this world needs and that's what the world wants to see. We're gonna continue the conversation on our social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Uh, you can look us up, Straight Up Show, Straight Up The Show on Instagram, and Straight Up Shreveport on YouTube. Until then, there's only one rule to the show is, you have to stay straight up.